a rule of thumb when helping faculty or teachers move online yep. is that it usually takes them about three years to really develop their comfort and their voice teaching online. Now, we also see that in face-to-face -face teaching. A brand new teacher mm -hmm. is not comfortable in the classroom that first year. Mm, it I takes see. them a few years to develop their comfort, develop their whole repertoire, and really feel like they've they've matured as a teacher. But doctor, I mean, for let's say younger people who were born during the year 2000, I think it is easy for them to to adapt to online learning. I mean, at I mean for now, um, but. How about, you know, the, let's say, the middle-aged teacher or the older-aged teacher who, you know, who have tra traditional, traditionally teach in class? I mean, I mean, is it hard for them? I mean, as you know it? So we don't really see generational differences. That's okay. probably surprising, but oh, okay. just because kids are born in 2000 and they learn how to use these devices yes, yes. for whatever doesn't really make them great online learners. Um, by that same token, I mean, my generation built the internet. <laughs> we understand. But, but it really for example, well. in the case of you know developing countries like Cambodia, you, you know, the generation before they were not really mm -hmm. adapted to the internet. So, mm -hmm. so if you were to design, it's more, it is definitely yeah. more about one's experience with technology. Yes. But also, we find folks who don't have any experience with technology can be very adaptive, very mm -hmm. flexible. Um, others may not be so open to learning. It's really on an individual to individual basis. So I've worked with folks who never used any technology and helped them move online. They were fantastic educators online. I've also worked with others who did really struggle to make the adaptation. Mm. So we don't we don't tend to see generational differences per se. Um, but you definitely will see differences with individuals. Some people take much longer to develop their comfort with it. In fact, when we're, so we, we see that same process in all of the modalities. So basically, online or not online, it's there's it's, time. There, there's, there's time, time, time to mature, to make time. grow, develop, find one's teaching voice. Yes, doctor. But at the same time, you were mentioning about you know the variables in in online learning. There, let's say thirty or something like that. Mm -hmm. So how about you know? I mean, taking Cambodia as the context. You know, there are a gap in, in the rural areas and there's a gap in, in the urban areas. And mm -hmm. um, so how about, you know, logistically, if, I mean, of course, everything takes time. Yeah. But in order to bring, like, at a good pace, at a good, you know, uh, let's say, level. So, I, I mean... Does it need a lot of infrastructure to do it, like good computers? So this is where I think the whole idea of an ecosystem is really important. Yes. No one modality is the end-all be-all. No modality is the single solution. Just like face-to-face -face has its own limitations, which yes. we've experienced, online has its limitations too. There may be times, and there are a lot of instances, a lot of countries that are building out their mobile infrastructure. So instead of relying on the internet or online specifically, they're really developing more um, uh, broadband and uh, mobile connectivity. Mm -hmm. So instead of getting on the computer connecting to the internet, they're doing more education through devices, yes. tablets that connect to their mobile plan. We actually use a lot of that in New Mexico, the state that I'm from. We have very rural areas mm -hmm. because we have like Native American reservations, yes, yes. right? That are very large, very sparsely populated. They don't have the same infrastructure as, say, New York City. So, in those areas, we actually use mobile infrastructure to be able to provide any sort of education at a distance. Oh, what do you mean by mobile infrastructure? You mean like mobile cell towers? Oh, oh cell towers. Yeah, what your yeah. device connects to. Ah, okay. okay. Yeah. So if you're not connected to the internet on your device, you're connected to a cell tower. That's what's giving you, that's what's causing the information to flow back and forth. That's really robust infrastructure actually that you can tap into. And we are seeing a lot of countries that are just sort of leapfrogging over the internet and going straight to mobile as their infrastructure. Mm. So, so if you were wanting to, if you were wanting to deliver distance or remote education out to rural areas, I probably wouldn't rely on online infrastructure, the internet. Yes, probably yeah. would switch to mobile. 
Now, the line between online and mobile is very blurry. There's a lot of the tools that we use for online learning that are available on mobile devices Just and so. through mobile connectivity as well. So that line is getting really blurry. So if I were looking to expand infrastructure in a place like Cambodia, I actually probably would be thinking about expanding mobile connectivity, like more cell towers, more cell and tower. being able to provide more affordable devices to people. Yes, Doctor. So yeah. again, it is still something that takes time, but it, it's it not impossible to do. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so on that point, there was an interesting study that looked at the schools and institutions that fared well during the pandemic. The ones that did okay, that had no problem, didn't really seem to have their feathers ruffled, those were ones that have been doing online and mobile learning for at least 10 years. Mm. Now what that means is they built an infrastructure and they'd also developed those habits. So just like you were talking about, it takes time for people to learn, it takes time for them to be comfortable. Those were institutions where they'd had that time, they'd taken that time and they had already made the investment. So I get it. A lot of places have not made that investment now. Um, today's a great day to start. <laughs> <laughs> so that in two, three, five years, if there's another disruption, then you've got the infrastructure, and then you've also got the habits of using, interacting, all of that that's already built. Yes, doctor. But I mean, generally speaking for Cambodia, I mean, during COVID, uh, despite the hecticness and mm -hmm. despite all the shortcomings, because it, it was so quick. Mm -hmm. So. Based on your um, opinion, based on your view, I mean, h how good is Cambodia in, in managing online learning during, during that uh, distress time? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's specific to Cambodia. Yeah, yeah. Very few places managed it well, including mm. the United States. Yeah, yeah. We had a lot of communities that don't have widespread internet. Mm. They struggled too. Really, the only country that I think managed it well during the pandemic was Australia. Australia. The reason Australia was in such a good position was because they have been investing in distance education mm. for decades. Is so it not because just online. They're, they're dispersed uh, territory? Is they're it? extremely oh, spread out, right? Okay. Large yeah. country, lots of rural, very yes. hard to access. You've got lots of districts, right, where students are very spread out. Mm. So they've been implementing all kinds of different types of distance education for decades. So they, they've they implemented uh, what's called correspondence courses where they have a whole print infrastructure. They've made use of telephone, radio, video. Mm. They developed video conferencing capabilities to connect different sites to each other. Yes. When internet came along, they developed online learning and then they've also been exploring with mobile learning. So when the pandemic hit for them, it was almost like they just had a menu of options to choose from where they could go right down the line. You know, do you have online? Great, if so, use it. If not, do you have radio and television? Great, if so, use it. If not, what about the print infrastructure? Most places didn't have that. So I don't think Cambodia did any worse than anybody yeah, else. Yeah. Not only that, having met with folks at the schools this week, you guys have some really innovative people who are thinking about and building great ideas, entire programs, very creative online classes. I think what I've been seeing this week is Cambodians who are innovating and creating wonderful solutions. That's actually inspiring. And I wish other countries would do that too. A lot of other countries are, some aren't. But I think the fact that folks are having a dialogue right now about what do we do, how do we do that better? That's a big positive. I think that's to be commended.